<laughs> so uh let's switch in english uh, <laughs> multilingual uh, uh monday morning uh welcome everybody thank you to the icc lectures for hosting uh, uh, our our lecture his lecture and thank you to francois dufault who uh, uh, is a professor at the University Laval in Quebec, in Canada. And uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he had a PhD at the University College London, in London. Uh, and uh, he's working, he's been working for a very long time uh, in Quebec, uh, in the city of, of Quebec, in Quebec City. Uh, working in this particularly uh, uh, lively and, uh, and courageous university, which is the University of Laval, uh, old Francophone university, but uh, really strong and, and powerful, although the distance from the rest <laughs> of the, uh, Canada is quite, quite strong for our standards, for Canadian standards, it's very close. Uh, uh, he's been uh, our guest uh, other times, uh, uh, but today is particularly, I'm particularly happy for uh, his presence here because uh, he will talk uh, 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 about a, a subject of study he has cultivated, I mean, has been cultivating since a very long time, that is the uh, uh, urban context uh, of urb Canadian urban context, but with particular uh, relationship with the uh, incredible to our standards, environmental context, uh, whatever the word environmental may mean in our, in our terms, the environmental context that Canada offers in Quebec, but also outside Quebec. Francois. Uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll switch to English for the presentation. Yes. Uh, and thanks, uh, Sergio, for the invitation. Um, when I saw the, the theme of the, of the lectures, uh, first, uh, to love or hate architecture, uh, I thought it was very interesting. Um, and uh, as if architecture was a person, and uh, we would have to choose whether we like it or not. Uh, it's a uh, like a decent person or undecent person. Um, and then also the question of architecture and environment, uh, which is interesting because, especially in a Canadian context, where you perceive the idea of the wildlife and the nature, um, architecture is everything but in relationship to nature. And we will uh, discuss uh, this today uh, in this uh, presentation, which I entitled How to Decipher Architecture Built in Canada. Um, so, um, in the order of the world, Canada is a nice subject matter. It illustrates from, a, from the outside the progress of modern civilization with its Pan-American material comfort and a form of social discernment associated with Northern Europe. This political project offers a nuance to the United States, a more liberal Europe, a more collective America, which finds itself relevant to foreign eyes in its alternative experience among the evolution of Western societies. Canada was politically redefined during the 1960s as a bilingual and bicultural federation, offering then, then a model of political and cultural openness to the construction of multilingual Europe. From the 1980s, the political model shifts towards a multicultural society as uh, the international immigration upset the historical heritage. Here again, Canada procl uh, proclamation appear confident in a reference while many Western countries are confronting large immigration waves. While the success of both the bilingual and multicultural society remains an open to social and political discussion as, as scholars interested in architecture, our research should explore the environmental answer consistent or contesting the cultural, social, and political claims. When one wants to illustrate architecture in Canada, two images are essential. Habitat 67 by Moshe Saadi, um, and the modern villa uh, in the forest, such as the Maison Paysage by my colleague Pierre Thibault at Laval University. The first illustrate the urban utopia 
Uh, and the second, the environmental harmony reflecting the benevolent image of Canada. Yet these projects are more exceptions than the everyday experience of the built environment in Canada. Conversely, the facade of Amsterdam affixed in, the nine, in 2022 uh, uh, to a shopping center in, in Minton, Alberta, belongs to the university, uh, universe of the North American suburbs. They evoke both the decorated shed of Las Vegas, the limitation of folk multiculturalism, and a contradictory between uh, modernity between the decor and the experience. And you can see the plan in the corner uh, where you realize that the facade has no relationship with the plan. Um, this seminar is an opportunity to discuss various interpretation about a history of architecture in Canada, or as scholar initially intended, the characterization of Canadian architecture. An argument discussed in, discussed in 1971 in, by Melvin Charmy in his conference towards the definition of architecture in Quebec, which I sent a, a week ago. Uh, following Charney's critical observation about the production of a high and low built environment, or the gap, the gap between a, a, what the Portuguese call arquitectura erudita, or like a, not, uh, you know, erudite architecture and a ver vernacular one, I will introduce a thesis developed by Ant Anthony D. King on colonial cities. Uh, the full discussion is an attempt to provide a more robust, fr ro robust framework for sorting the built environment, whether celebrated or ignored by scholars. Uh, therefore, the seminar is, is structured in, in four parts. The, uh, first, I will share an overview of the interpretation of architecture in Canada through recent publication, including the different perspective and emerging between English and French references. Then I will review the conceptual framework developed by Anthony King in colonial cities. Um, according to King, the colonial project is divided between two strategies, a, co a commercial colony and a settlement colony. The thesis suggests that the real estate colonial reality structures the economic and social expectations, setting the, part, the political order, which are, defining the, which are defining the condition for architect architectural production. Uh, this thesis contains the current environmental issue or social inclusion agenda, which structures the discourse uh, used by architectural uh, professors, professional and scholars. Um, while the presentation addresses a specific Canadian context, the discussion intends to lead towards a more general discussion of what, uh, what to study and expect from architectural history. Okay. Yeah. History of architecture uh, in Canada, a moving, moving target. The knowledge, knowledge of architecture, uh, its development and evolution remains in the first place the result of research and publication carried out mainly by university scholars, professors, and their graduate students. Uh, Laval University Library holds the, uh, for the request Architecture plus Canada plus History uh, 344 uh, publications uh, divided half, 52% uh, in French and 48% in English. Only uh, 10 uh, research theses uh, are, uh, were conducted at Laval on this, uh, with these three words. Uh, when the search specifies architecture, Quebec and history, the number of publications rise to 580, of which 90% are French and 10% in English. Here, the number of university theses increases to 124. The first observation on intellectual production reveals that for a silent discipline such as architecture, the linguistic dimension and the cultural perspective frame out the gaze, the analysis, and the territories analyzed. The world of architectural publishing has experienced an exponential growth since the 1990s. To a lesser degree, it also occurred in Canada among French and English speaking publishers. However, since 2014, for both subjects, uh, Architecture Canada, Quebec history. The results are more modest, uh, respectively uh, 23 and 42 publications, 22 for Canada, 42 for Quebec, including 16 uh, research theses, whether a, a master or, or a doctoral thesis for Quebec. By skimming over the title, the linguistic perspectives open two fields of inter investigation. Publication in French focus on specific topics, a building type, a city, a region, and a few architects' monography. Conversely, among the 23 titles on Canada uh, and largely written in English, there are eight books that offer historical synthesis 
three monographs, three case studies, and nine titles where the word architecture is used as a metaphor to describe political project or social structure, which means about one third of the books have nothing to do with architecture, but architecture is used as a concept. Out of the 14 books on... Okay, sorry. Yeah, just the can say from YouTube. Okay, they cancel from YouTube. No, that's not a problem. Not sure. I'm not nice enough. It was my fault. Puoi dirmi cosa si vede? Sì, è solo che qua vedo si vede il PowerPoint e il cazzo di Ah, ah. Si la quello che c'è adesso. Questa qui. Poi quando c'è quello che c'è adesso. si vede come si può fare la foto. Sì, della pena. Della pena del PowerPoint. Perché non è la posizione. Ah, è vero, sì. Prova a scontare. Adesso si vede. Le altre immagini? No. No, no ti dici lo schermo è sempre la prima che tu stai facendo condividi la pagina di PowerPoint o lo schermo? Ma che è il testo più alto? No? Eh, forse sì. Okay. Adesso metti in presentazione. Non c'è solo un nome. Sì, sì, sì. E adesso? Okay, okay. 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 Sorry. So, um, okay. Uh, among the, the, I was saying about the titles, like, out of the 14 books on Canadian architectural history, eight intends to apply the national common narrative and focus on the 20th century. Um, among these history of architecture in Canada, the main argument is that the evolution of the built environment environment mirrors the political evolution of the country. Regional realities, those of the large city or the First Nation, are combined to present with selected project, a formal expression of architecture in Canada. That is, the illustration focused on the architectural composition, the style and the actors, namely individual, individual architects and some important firm, firms. Uh, the common, common theme is modernity. That is to establish a form of correspondence between the political, economic, and cultural evolution and the production of the built environment expressed by the various avant-garde in architecture after 1945. Architecture production is as uh, a spe spatial expression of the political project to modernize the, for uh, the formal and technical environment. It becomes the illustration of a social redefinition of today multi today's multicultural Canada. The eight works are all written by academics, only one which is taken from a doctoral thesis. They are, they are all also linked to research project and exhibition, all receive a form of, form of sponsorship from public research fund and adopt the guidelines and seem favored by the federal government. The inter intersecting consensus among the English speaking scholars testify to a common cultural pr perspective on the inter interpretation of modern Canada. But what about the historical narrative? The narrative is primarily organized along chrono chronological basis, often divided by reg region to address various real realities and issues. Within this framework, the author presents an inventory of project and the responsible architect. International reference references underline the commitment with the avant-garde carrying the image, image of modernity. Sometimes authors allude about exchanges uh, with other actors in the world of art and culture. Uh, Marshall McLuhan and the theory of communication, or Jean-Paul Riappel, a painter who mainly lived in Paris. These link with personalities enjoying even greater prestige suggest that the impact of Canadian architecture also contributed uh, to our contemporary Western culture. A strange feeling emerged from these assemblage of references. Everything to remain description, descriptive and socialite oriented. No technical, cultural, or social explanation for such an evolution, apart from the genius of the professional mention. Who are the, the architects? Who are they? What were their training and their experience? Who were the patrons and their expectation? What were the means gathered to produce this brave new world uh, environment? Um, 
No allusion to the structural condition behind these projects and changes. However, as early as 1978, John Larimer book, The Developers, exposed how much the construction of post-war Canada was a product of public policies in the residential, commercial, industrial, and the public procurement sphere. The first essay is Architecture and National Identity, the Centennial Project, 50 Years On, by Marco El Polo and Colin Ripley, both professors at the School of Architecture at the Metropolitan University of Toronto. The exhibition catalog discuss, discusses the building construction for the centennial of the Canadian Confederation in 1967. Uh, these projects intended to be exemplary and an answer to the report on the Royal Commission on the Advancement of the Art, Humanities and Science in Canada, 1949-51 called the Massey, Massey Report. This document assessed in, in Canada the cultural and scientific development in the immediate post-war period. It recommended the federal government involvement in the field of art and science, regardless that these areas were provincial jurisdiction within the Canadian federal structure. English Canada saw these measures positively as supporting the development of a Canadian post-war identity. They were an answer to the growing American influence at the effective effective detachment, detachment from Great Britain. Indeed, uh, the federal government had issued a citizenship law in 1947, replacing the title of British subject. Uh, we had a Canadian passport in 1948, uh, before there were no Canadian passport. The 1967 Sentinel project were cultural and technical buildings, theaters, museum, uh, and scientific um, centers whose program and architecture were to, explain, to display the emerging uh, culture and the effervescence of the 1960s. Uh, Expo 67 in Montreal was the ephemeral synthesis of this vast exper experimental program. The others emphasize, and here you have like all the projects located in Canada. Uh, here you have the, the example of the Grand Théâtre in Quebec City, uh, built in 71. Um, the authors emphasize in conclusion how much initial positivism in, of this initiative and the architecture then perceived as avant-garde with the brutalist expression and the megastructure will quickly lose its symbolic values of a better world after 1967. The authors suggest, suggest a range of explanation for the disfavor. The political tension between Quebec and Canada presented a concrete social, cultural, and political conflict along linguistic perspective. However, Nothing indicates how architecture would be an issue, while literature, cinema, and performing arts, theaters, and music illustrated the existence of two relatively sealed cultural solitudes. The authors add the, the, the decline of the institution budget based on an antipathy for the city. Only this final explanation engage the responsibility of the architects and their client, original or subsequent, only finding that the mood of fashion to justify one or, or the other aesthetics. Two following books, Making Toronto Modern Architecture and Design, 1895-1975, by Christopher Armstrong, published in 2014, and Competing Modernism, Toronto, New City, All and Square, by Capellas and Armstrong, uh, 2015, explored the modernization of Toronto in the 20th century. As the city became the Canadian metropolis in the 1970s, the experience began. Uh, its experience became exemplary in defining, therefore, anything truly Canadian. And here you have, like, uh, as a previous book, they all follow a kind of chronological order, and you have the table of content. Um, in 1958, competition for the Toronto New City Hall was won by the Finnish architect uh, Visual Redel. This is indeed an exceptional work in a symbolic dimension, program and construction. It also further the, illustrated the Scandinavian cultural hypothesis as an alternative to American influence for Canadian architecture. So Toronto City Hall's symbolic contribution was comparable to the Sydney Opera in Sydney, Australia, another evolving British dominion. And you have in the corner the, the initial proposal by Canadian architect. 
However, the historical transformation expo uh, for Toronto since 1895 underlined the weight of American references. And here you have a series of examples of building from the late 19th century, 19th century to the 1960s or 70s actually. Um, and then the weight of American reference, it defined most of the public and private architecture between the provincial par parliament, the old city hall, the business the factories and villas of the elite. Some religious architecture and the best school meticulously uh, reproduce English neo, English neo Gothic and Edwardian references. Toronto imitates Chicago, both before and after the construction of, a, of the Scandinavian city hall. The consensus shared by real estate players, public administration, and professionals, including architects, suggests a durable common cultural, urban, and architectural culture unchallenged by the sophisticated and natural import, architectural import. Similarly, similarly, these shared ideals appear on the other hand to be relatively indifferent to the original natural environment, to the history of the place, to the claim of multiculturalism profile of the new immigrant to represent more than half of the population. Architecture apparently remains unchallenged by individual identity. The two last books, um, deal with the history of architecture uh, in Canada. In 2016, as part of Modern Architecture and History Collection, uh, Liscom and uh, Sabatini published a volume on Canada. In the manner of making uh, Toronto modern, the author proposed to legitimize uh, modernity in architecture uh, in Canada according to a chron chronological logic throughout the 20th century. That is to say that the historical framework considered modernization as the manifest destiny announced by the end of the 19th century to various exceptional and exemplary projects. Um, the conclusion entitled Canada Modern Modernist Legacy states that the transformation of the built environment reflects the shift from an economy based on natural resources, uh, extraction as we saw before uh, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, um, to one based on design expertise. No example nor fact support such an assertion. For, an assent, for, for instance, data from the federal statistic contradicts such a statement. And indeed, foreign architecture commission counts for an average between one to 3% of contracts among Canadian firms. This chapter continues by globalizing, uh, with this global, globalizing allegory by quoting Le Corbusier, Moshe Savdi, and Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry was born in Toronto and immigrated to the United States. Uh, this underlined our architectural production in Canada is a part of a network of international, international exchange while recognizing the difficulty of defining a recurring characteristic of uh, Canadian architecture. As the others conclude, it is a moving target. Failing to find a common solution in the composition, the program, and the construction, the other present various work in architects, which would form a constellation of stars with meaning remain to be defined. The good intention prevail consisting, uh, consistent with the brave new world allegory. Uh, here as images, you have, of course, Habitat 67, you have the Galleria done by uh, Calatrava for uh, an office building in Toronto. Uh, you have the seashore of Vancouver uh, with its rise, and you have uh, the uh, Northern Territory uh, uh, Legislative Assembly in Yellowknife uh, with the idea of the of a, political building representing the First Nation isolated in the wood. Um, it's interesting to have a parliament isolated in the wood, meaning uh, that nobody can know what is going on, uh, which is an interesting idea of democracy. Um, okay. The second essay, Canadian Modern Architecture, is edited by Elsa Lam and Graham Lively. Uh, she's the editor of the professional journal Kind and Architect, and he's a professor at the University of Calgary. The book is organized around four axes. Uh, there are about 15 chapters written mainly by university professors and a few journalists from the field. The editorial framework is geographical. It alternates between uh, national reading, uh, the national movement, as you see, uh, and uh, uh, reading on the scale of Canada to counterbalance with international influences in the second part. Uh, sections three and four explore again the tension between regional experience and, and those perceived as more central associated with the populous province of Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. The editorial strategy avoids a unit, unitary definition of the Canadian architecture, but as, it, but as in the previous essay, it proceeds with the same succession of exemplary project and architect to celebrate uh, 
some signs emphasizing their local or global death dimension. Um, here I will present just a few images of this, of these ideal and the, what I call the modern utopia uh, with Expo 67 and a, a project for a Nordic uh, town hall. Um, uh, so these were projects of the 60s and late 50s. Uh, these are images of uh, uh, Nordic utopia about how to colonize the North or settle in the North. Um, and uh, so you see uh, different ideas, uh, like a, a building, like a wall to protect against the wind. And they try to try to make a, uh, the, in the corner, you have a Eskin scheme of a very enclosed village. And uh, then you have this kind of futuristic uh, project for schools uh, and office building, um, like, uh, like it was from a Kubrick movie. And, and this is what the Nordic village actually looks like uh, in Canada, um, which is like uh, basically a, a northern, a northern suburbs uh, settled in the uh, in the Nordic environment. The chapter devoted to Quebec, where I live and teach, makes a political and cultural prosecution by asking the question about the existence of a distinctive architecture. The author, uh, David Theodore, professor at McGill University in Montreal, considered a positive tension between tradition and modernity, which he connects to the larger cultural and political disagreement between Quebec and Canada. At first, uh, this would be, according to him, linked to the survival of a national identity supporting tradition. Uh, he never names it, as the French was like the N word in the, uh, uh, as the, N -word in the English speaking uh, sphere and unspeakable. Uh, for French. And the second would be that the international culture and modernity is represented by Canada. The, the explanation fits perfectly into the rhetoric of cultural domination that opposed local conservatism to progress uh, brought from outside. However, a few pages later in, the, in, his, in his essay, Theodore has become ironic about apparent contr cultural contradiction. Two public institutions, the Quebec National Library, La Grande Bibliothèque, and the uh, Fine Arts Museum in Quebec City proceed with architectural international competition to select uh, a winning scheme designed incidentally by a foreign architect. How should a cho choice could celebrate a national identity or simply such a choice confirming the lack of a distinct architectural, co architectural culture in Quebec, dismissive consequently the, the existence of a, an existing culture and its poli political grievance? Of course, this is a little short-sighted and something else is at stake. Um, Theodore mentioned the provincial policy of public competition for cultural institutions established in, 19, in the 1990s, a case unique in Canada. It evokes the role of architects in, engaged in the residential field between Westwick Chalet villas and townhouses. He regrets that formal tectonic qualities are secondary towards the emphasis on social value. He concludes that beyond the tension between tradition and modernity, hides the opposition between collective and individual, the controversism versus modernity, provincialisms against universalism. We are not far from Marx, Weber, and the superiority of the Protestant ethics. The short presentation of selected books is not a, system, a systematic survey, but I, uh, but I agree that I expose only a few aspects. From my experience, I suspect that the more systematic analysis would, be, would reach comparatively similar findings. First, that the editorial line saw a link between economic, political, and social development and production of the built environment. Architecture is analyzed as a sp spatial expression of contemporary Canada uh, and its economic, social, and political ambition. Second, the historical development, the original variation, and different build attacks do not draw a common cultural, social, and technical thread. At best, one ob observes various experiences. Um, of different building types, often parallel in space and time. Are they contradiction, tension, or simply reflecting different circumstances? Uh, for those who have read Melvin Charney's essay of 1971, it is curious to note that uh, no one uh, that he had denounced 50 years ago the same, the same critical discourse, indifferent to class issues, yet uh, so determining uh, to understand the resources and tension associated with architecture. From this perspective, the differences of uh, or tension observed by historians, um, uh, there'll be great hoping to identify Canadian architecture will be the logical result of social, economic, and cultural order that structure and requires differences. 
beyond the welfare state and its social, multiple, and ethnic inclusion, the production of the built environment could remain a class-bound process rather than a collective and national proposal. Well, I'll go to the second part about uh, colonial uh, logic um, and the built environment by King. In 1985, Anthony D. King proposed a chapter entitled Colonial Cities, a Global Pivot of Change in a Collective World Called Colonial Cities, they say of an urbanism in a colonial context published in the Netherlands. Uh, King observes the paradox of the colonial project in the face of real estate, urban and architectural investment. The colonial logic intend to extract the maximum of resources with a min minimal level of investment to increase the return of, on capital to the metropolis. Consequently, an investment in infrastructure produ producing a built environment on a colonized territory would be a diversion of funds, either for the extraction of resources or the profit expected from the trade. According to this logic, the colonial enterprise could be compared to a hunter-gatherer approach and is reminiscent to the strategy strategies of Europeans who came to fish for cod and, uh, uh, and hunt whales in Newfoundland and the Gulf of St. Orange by the late 16th century. These little known endeavors preceded a few decades before the official expedition to the, to the New World discovery. Each summer, fishermen across, across the Atlantic settled in the summer, built oven to mail the whale blubber and wooden structure to dry and salt cod before, before returning at the beginning of the autumn to Europe. Archaeological finding confirmed the ephemeral nature of the seasonal settlement. The discovery of Canada in 1535 uh, 34 by French explorer Jacques Cartier is a shift from a private and artisanal activity to a state sponsored project with larger trading expectation and subsequently infrastructure and real estate expenditure. Indeed, King observed that a more systematic resource extraction requires some minimal infrastructure and local accommodation. It is necessary to ensure the transshipment of the goods, a warehouse between the trips, a place of residence, and a form of enclosure to secure the traveler and their goods. The trading posts uh, planted on the African American coast uh, then find their initial coherence in program form and construction. The production of the built environment at the urban and architectural scale is part of a conceptual uh, scheme where the logic of the colonial infrastructure become the pivot between the international logic of the colonial project and the local condition, including the, the resource, the labor, the interland market, which are effectively and sub symbolically found in the urban space. And you see uh, the scheme proposed by um, by King at the top uh, right, um, where the city really, which is the build space, is this pivot. Um, from this initial, initial reasoning, note the scope of the, of the Western process of colonization between the 15th to 20th century. He observed nuance about the nature of real estate investment and transformation of the build environment. Uh, King proposed to distinct distinguish conceptually two types of colonial project, the colonial colony, the commercial colony, and the settlement colony. If there are differences articulated to the level of development of the indigenous society in, encountered by the colonizer. The colonial colony takes root in a, color, in a territory already populated and organized, not, notably by a socially, religiously, and political, tor, politically structured societies. These indi indigenous par partners support the extraction of resources, leaving the colonizer to, to direct his resources on controlling extraction and trade, including imports. Furthermore, the pattern limit the investment around the undergathered logic with shipping infrastructure, securing commercial and residential premises and providing a minimal set of institutions to legitimize the partnership and its necessary political control. control. Conversely, faced with the absence of disappearance of an organized society, the colonizer must adopt a settlement policy to ensure both extraction, production, and international trading opportunities. The settlement comment requires the import of new inhabitants, settlers, or slaves. It implies the redesign of the interland property, land division, and the landscape management. Consequently, consequently the construction of cities support the exchange of export and import where different neighborhoods apply various warning patterns, segregating urban function and social classes. King analysis uh, King's analysis uh, uh, listed without excluding the experience of the British and the Dutch colonial empire. 
uh, while Spanish, Portuguese, and French colonial experience different, differs in some respect, notably a religious conversion and the inclination to, to favor mixed race population, King's theor theoretical framework remain relevant and applicable to the urban and architectural dimension in, their, in these various colonial endeavors. Um, so commercial and, 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 um, and settlement colony in the Canadian context. As first, uh, King's framework is provocative as it contradicts two common beliefs about Canada. Primarily, it suggests that Canada as an evolution of the British North America was not exempl an, an exemplary settlement project developed after the American independence, but the uh, territories and distinct colonies experiencing various colonial development strategy. Next, as Canada is not necessarily the post and colonial and post-national post state it pertains to claim, notably in architecture and urban planning. The condition and objective of the commercial colony is that the settlement uh, make it possible to reframe the evolution of colonial real estate strategies uh, between the same empire, between uh, territories and various, uh, uh, in various territories in time. Um, Canada presents a territorial de development based on a voluntary and encouraged immigration. Slavery never existed as a systematic condition, uh, as no production or trade requires for uh, requires its introduction. However, this general picture must be uh, nuanced. Uh, Quebec, as a settlement country, uh, was a settlement country under the French colonial regime, uh, early 16th century, uh, 1759. After a formal session to the British Crown in 1763, the new, call, the new authorities intended to attract English-speaking settlers and assimilate the French inhabitants. By 1774, so basically 12 years after, 11 years after, this has failed, notably because the commercial wealth and activity of the St. Lawrence Valley remained limit, uh, as limited, whether under French or British rule. To avoid the spread of political unrest developing in the former English colonies, later the United States, the British agreed to the Quebec Act of 1774, which basically maintained their French laws which were not properly allowed the Roman Catholic faith. Became, Quebec became a commercial colony. The French-speaking inhabitants retained the basic right and opportunity bound to agricultural production and forest lumbering, whereas the English-speaking minority controlled most of the colonial trade, including the extraction of resources and the later the industrial de development from 1660 to 1960. The other uh, Canadian provinces to a fluctuating degrees and intensity followed the settlement pattern that attempt to replicate the British and American built environment. English Canada was established as loyalist settlers by loyalist settlers who had taken refuge in British North America after the United States independence in, 18, in 1783. In the Quebec context of a British commercial colony, the goal of resources extraction, export, and exchange for manufactured goods became the main uh, development pattern between 1660, 1760 to 1860. The colony project focused on lo the logic of extraction. Uh, transportation infrastructure was essential. The road and railway converged uh, to the port where the products of two dip, uh, dependent and complementary economies will be exchanged. The importance given to infrastructure, port, railway, road, aviation remain crucial and are currently vested in the authority of the federal government, government which ensure the prevailing inter imperial interests. The goods are secure in commercial areas, warehouse adjacent to transportation infrastructure, building with economic function, warehouse, store, office, banks, are all the essential relay for the policy of extraction and exchange. Economic authorities must be spatially pro protected uh, the president of a fort is a deterrent uh, for both the native and competing colonial powers. Courthouse and custom house uh, and custom house replace them in peaceful time. In this context, the colonial project itself um, asserts itself through the deliberately faithful reproduction of the archetype of the metro metropolis. The toponymy takes up the name of the place, the shape of the city, and the idea of the time, the architecture, uh, uh, the imported types and archetypes. And here you have a few examples of this, uh, this uh, architecture, uh, this official architecture of the, of the settlement economy, where, where are, uh, you have the, the bridge, uh, the infrastructure of the port, uh, the city hall of one neighborhood in Montreal, which was mainly upper class English speaking, and the housing of the upper classes uh, under construction. <clears throat> 
The first colonial phase often resumed in simple construction. However, the political or colonial story required to display cultural and technical superiority, often expressed by a monumentality and a care with resources far superior to those counseled to the native for the same community's institutions. Their military installation, the administrative building, including the judiciary, the religious churches, uh, religious churches, and their diminished dominational school all underline their cultural and technical superiority in the face of the indigenous environment. Albert Mimi has noticed in Portrait of the Colonized how much town planning and architecture in the colonial context of French Tunisia reminded every each day in silence the grandeur of the one culture over another to the colonizer as well to the, uh, to the colonized. The definition of neighborhood includes spatial segregation between the native and the incoming immigrant. From one street or a full neighboring municipality, a white city was reversed for colonial. It offered a shelter in which housing, social, and cultural services provided church, school, hospital, and exclusive clubs. The environment structure local spatial solidarity among expatriates. Residential has sometimes to compromise with the climate and the material resources. The house of the elite would be faithful reproduction of metropolitan model and type, while the middle and working class would have to make occasional adaptation and, or invention. Urban planning and architecture reflected a form of relatively sensitive sp spatial segregation with expression of, of the two solitude, title of Hugh McLennan novel, Expose Indifference and Separate Development. And here, example of this uh, native uh, landscape built by uh, the, the other, uh, the, 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 yeah, the indigenous uh, people, as you could say. Um, I understand that this interpretation is an outline for a thesis or a book uh, to write, which I should address in the coming years. However, I believe that such a bold statement, seductive and in many aspects effective to outline general patterns, should never underestimate in the field of architecture and planning the individual process of every project. I would like to conclude with a few uh, observations and warnings regarding architectural research. The commercial and settlement colonial conceptual pattern suggests some common strategies regarding the control of international trade, transportation, business district, administrative institution, and they differ in the extent of the white city and what is left to the native. The modern architectural and urban pattern, uh, patterns between the need and infrastructure of the, new, the global economy and the resource left to the local one are super, surprisingly similar. Where Canadian historians were looking for the expression of a common identity cap capable of celebrating and developing a, a shared identity, uh, King suggests the presence of parallel cultures linked to social classes and actors engaged sometimes in a global logic, sometimes in a local logic on the social material and cultural and economic level. The evolution of built form, regardless of the scale and the nature of, of the sources and the ambition of the solution are not displaying tension and contradiction. They simply reflect parallel coexistence of contra contrasting production condition, a global architecture and a local ver vernacular practice. Um, the paradoxical condition of the, of the global architecture is that its cultural authority requires to be faithful to external model, but at the same time, the less inter intervention is original and adapted to the context which it seeks to ignore while exploiting. It. Conversely, Vernacular production with limited material, financial, and cultural resources must confront a dilemma between assuming its condition and adapting and trying to prove its legitimacy through fragmentary and symbolic imitation. Um, this apparent class bound structure open, in fact, the large, large spectrum of the middle class design option. So, as you see, you have in theory these two models, but what happened is that they overlap. Uh, the architectural project is a project is a process of choice summarized by the design concept in this process. Different issues meet, are combined and oppose each other, the program, the composition, the construction, the legal and financial condition, and different scale between uh, at different scale, ter the territory, the urban logic, the building itself, and its interfitting. The role is of the architect is marked out by the trust and courage of the client and the correct and the correct collaboration of other professional engineer, plan planners, other consultants, for whom is often ensured the coordination of decisions complementary to the subject. Architecture is an international culture and a local practice, site-specific 
and, histor and uh, confronted by historical circumstances, where the past and the present are challenged by the speculative perspective on the future of the development. Suddenly, every project is a prototype and singular endeavors where individual choices made by the architects and clients are gambled with the current and future circumstances. A wide range of design solution reflects the presence of unrestricted social opportunities, a narrower one, a more effective control and class segregation. Within those choices, practical decisions should not underestimate the weight of symbolic components are as they play display of social and cultural aspiration. Indeed, immigration in a settlement colony is largely rationalized around the possibility of transgressing the original class boundaries. The notion of social class as they've developed by Baudu suddenly offers meaning to the concrete choices invested in urban architectural form. Therefore, architectural design is not about the effective identity but the aspiration for social status, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or physical handicap. Finally, the interest shown by uh, architects, by uh, Canadian architectural historian for the international current and its dissemination raise an interesting uh, question about their motivation. Is the question of evaluating the legacy, regardless of the condition of, of production, because it expressed an allegiance to both university elites and the dominant capital. On the other hand, how to assess a vernacular environment outside the existing building categories? Why defend something remaining unclass unclassifiable and invisible in the face of metropolitan model? In both cases, scholars' aspiration share so social ambition compar comparable to the object of study. I strongly believe that architectural history does not have to illustrate the concept developed in humanity. It is not an illustration of other histories, but the outcome of many interests combined by the means, rules, and ideal of an applied, applied art. The findings provide facts and observations which raise new questions to the field of knowledge invested in the process of building the environment, economy, sociology, law, cultural studies, technical experience. Um, Finally, I would, uh, I should remember uh, to, uh, it should remember, architectural history should remember to, uh, to inform architects about the design process. Uh, Fernando Tavora wrote that this design is a drama because it requires to make choice where not everything can be reconciled, reconciled additively. The quality of response is less in the specific design performance than on the balance between the different design issues in one moment in space and time. And I will just conclude with images of uh, the typical images of what is, is displayed internationally for, uh, for Canadian architecture, uh, what is built uh, um, um, as, as part of this multicultural society um, and this uh, North American uh, uh, landscape and work that is done by uh, 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 other architects in the smaller con uh, context uh, of uh, urban housing. Um, as we said, uh, ar architecture in Canada is a moving target and somewhere in between those three, uh, the, those three images that you can find it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no. It Thank you very much, uh, François. Thank you for this uh, quite important. Non, non, non si vede la faccia inquadrata, quindi non si sa se sono inquadrato. Ma ci sono? Ok. Sì, ah, sì, lì sopra, sì, è vero. Ok. C'è qua. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you very much. Hmm? No, 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 va benissimo, basta che ci sono. Thank you very much, and thank you for this brilliant composition of a, a, a very complicated uh, issue, a very complicated subject, because uh, national identities in architecture in general is very complicated. Uh, uh, national identity for modern architecture is even more complicated, okay. of course. National identity for uh, modern architecture in a country uh, where identity has been disputed for 
centuries, I think, is a, a really difficult task. So uh, your, recogn your recognition was particularly uh, brilliant, but also uh, challenging on many, many aspects if we consider the differences between, uh, uh, well, the, the banal difference, banal from this side of the ocean, banal differences between Toronto and Montreal, for instance, which are absolutely obvious. Uh, I have one question which, which has to do with national identity, which has to do with the built environment. Uh, concerning the books that you presented, the researches you presented, for, for, as far as I, uh, I know from some of the books I, I, I know, for instance, the one from Michelangelo Sabatino, and uh, from what you described, um, Canada architectural identity has always been regarded as an urban uh, uh, architectural identity. I mean, uh, we see uh, uh, Montreal, uh, Toronto, Quebec, uh, and then Winnipeg or Calgary or Vancouver, uh, uh, and they are cities, although not on a super metropolitan scale, uh, which has a Chinese scale today, but they are cities, mm -hmm. they are uh, uh, well-configured cities. Uh, while those debates quite rarely include the consideration that, I don't know, half of the population, more than half of the population, less than half of the population, Canada population, lives outside an urban context. I'm not meaning the far north uh, living in the ice uh, or something like that, but in very small uh, uh, cities. Now I was checking that even Vancouver, which is for us a symbol of metropolitan uh, uh, stimulating city, is something like 500,000 inhabitants, less than Turin, Vancouver, one of the uh, uh, meccas. <laughs> of, of the of, uh, of, for for us, uh, so do they consider this this other face of a uh, 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 um, Canadian uh, uh, way of building the environment? Uh, for instance, in terms of infrastructures. For instance, in terms of uh, 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 well, light and heavy infrastructures, mm -hmm. both of them, but also, for instance, in terms of, if not cities, we can say towns, villages, all the scale of, of that, well, we, we, we know are operating in different kinds uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of territorialities in Europe too, but in Canada in particular, I think. Well, I think at first, um, the, the main interest in, in large cities is, is really linked to the colonial system mm. uh, because this is where the power is. Uh, yeah. And this is where you produce an architecture that is comparable to what is built in the countries that are controlled in Canada. Uh, though, so therefore, uh, before the 1914, for example, the main trade partner was Britain and then Canadian cities tend to imitate Great Britain. And then between the two wars, it shifted gradually towards the United States after the Second World War and became the United States. And, uh, and until recently, the idea was that China would become the next uh, main uh, commercial partner. And so Canadian cities would have to co copy Chinese cities. Um, and it's interesting in the case of Vancouver, um, one of the big influx of immigrants in Vancouver was when uh, Hong Kong uh, was announced to be retroceded to China. And Canada offered basically to uh, Hong Kong citizen to buy uh, a, a condo, so buy a flat and get a passport. So you were become investors and therefore the city was, and suddenly uh, in, a, a, in order to allow these people to buy property, uh, they reduce the size of the flat. So the minimal flat would have to be about 16 square meters and then it was reduced to 35. Um, and this is not a racist comment, it's simply more a capitalist uh, measure, you know. Um, so I think the interest is really about that, it's really like the main focus is on, main, on the big city because um, it's reassuring. It tells that we are part of the first world, 
uh, and scholars are part of the first world and this is their main interest. The second thing is that um, in effect, uh, uh, regions and smaller cities are under a colonial order. Uh, they are, um, they, they have massive investment when it comes to extract resources, exploit resources, but otherwise they don't have any more. They don't have resources. Uh, they are very, they are relatively poor, and they have uh, uh, little, little uh, economic power. They have little authority. They have uh, very few uh, professional. They have, uh, for example, you have to understand that in Canada, um, cities are not. Um, are not um, autonomous government level. They are uh, created by provincial government. So they are under the jurisdiction of the provincial government. They're not like uh, the uh, il comune. They, there's no tradition that il comune could do something. No, the, the villages or the small town, they depend. So whenever they do a project, they, they will do a project because the federal government has decided that we do invest in certain thing and then they will pay for one third and the province will, will pay for one third and then the, pro the city will pay for one third. And so every uh, urban development uh, is always governed by upper government uh, and organized by upper, upper governments. So that explains also that uh, small towns have very, very little means and very little ambition, very little knowledge. And further to that, I mean, the, all the post-war uh, development engineered by the federal government was the suburbanization of Canada, uh, which means that these municipalities are even in a more difficult situation that they, are, they tend to be very spread out, with very low population, very low density. So all their money goes to support uh, unsust unsustainable urban system where you have very large gestion and very low population. Um, so, of course, there's no money for architecture, very little money for architecture uh, or for projects. Um, and so that's probably one of the, uh, the reasons why the, the, the gaze of, of scholars and others is, is not about that. But also, I think it's also that uh, um, as, um, as scholars and you know, university professors would be, or architects, we belong to, we belong, or we tend to belong to a social class, and we share some number of, of values and images, and uh, and these provincial environment are not providing the 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 symbol to which we we could pretend to belong to, you know, um, and so uh, it's why it's simply uh, ignored. Um, of course, you know, the discussion could be. Um, uh, it's more complex in the context of Quebec when you look at what was built uh, by the religious architecture because um, the Catholic Church has a, had a long tradition of building uh, institutions which were sometimes very ambitious regardless of the size of the villages, but that's another story. Uh, but I think in, in general, there's a complete disregard. Uh, or is that a disregard? There's a, uh, um, there's a, a, a lone interest in trying to find in Canada something that shows that we are part of the first world. Okay. And as long as it reproduces something else, we feel better about ourselves because we achieve something. And therefore, the whole issue of the national identity becomes very difficult because yeah. the national identity is about being some, somewhere else, something else. And then the, the relationship to the weather, the, cl the climate, the resources is very ambiguous. You know? uh, um, if you do, I mean, even if, if you do a simple thing like a, the kitchen renovation, um, if you really want to show your status, it's not, you won't use a natural stone of, uh, uh, extracted in Canada, you will use Italian marble. So, you know, the whole game of, uh, of social status goes through a foreign imports. And that's, that shows that regardless of the, the, the political structure, uh, colonial as uh, the colonial mentality remains, you know, uh, and and is supported. Uh, now it's called globalization, but yes. uh, I don't think it changed very much. More questions? But I, I, I think the the fact that Canada is peripheral. Uh, at the same time, it's not at the center of where any, anything is really happening, especially in architecture. Um, studying the Canadian context, uh, 
with this limitation, uh, raise interesting question about what is architecture, what it provides, what is urban planning, what is planning, why is the land is managed, what is the relationship to the environment? Um, and sometimes because you are on the periphery, um, things become less, uh, uh, less important. You know, you, you can discuss, you know, you, you, you can agree or disagree uh, with the result, but you can uh, at least discuss. Um, what is interesting about Abitos Kosan set is that um, it's a very powerful image and it's a very impressive place to visit, you know, but it's a complete nonsense. It completely failed its objective. Its objective was to be flexible, cheap, uh, you know, um, sustainable, uh, and it's anything but that. And if you see and you can find on the internet images of what is inside, it is really funny because you have these boxes, you know, that that makes you believe that you're in a 1960s uh, science fiction movie. And you go inside and there's people have, have done this kind of neoclassical or baroque decor, you know, and you see also the ambiguity of, of class status. The only, the, the only thing that makes it sustainable is that it's a rich neighborhood. So um, uh, all the problem, the environmental problem created by this environment are, are counterbalanced by the money of the residents and where they're fed up with their concrete boxes, they can, they have the money to go to the countryside, you know, if it were, if it were socializing, it would have been a disaster. Uh, but it's, it's a very, it's an utopia, and it's very interesting for that. And it's, it's been built well enough so they didn't have to confront the problem of Villa Savoie or the uh, Osanjo or Pompidou, but probably 25 years ago, we'll have the, the big decision to figure out if we restore it or do something else about it. And, and about restoration, uh, this was a, another sign of the problem that they showed at the beginning. So they were telling us how much history counted in, in uh, uh, Canadian universities and schools of architecture. Uh, it, it is also interesting how Canada is building its own notion of heritage, because obviously it's, a, it's an heritage that for some part, the neo-Gothic skyscrapers mm. in Toronto is shared with uh, uh, Chicago and mm. with all the rest of the United States. For another part, is shared all the uh, uh, older uh, uh, buildings built by the church. It's shared with Europe. Mm. So I, I, I think that probably also this made part of the construct because we know that the construction of a notion of heritage is the uh, attempt, the tentative construction of a national identity. So, but in that sense, it, what it, it's very interesting, and I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but um, the American um, have a long, to, I mean, the, the notion of heritage building uh, rise in the United States uh, when they had the exhibition in 1876 uh, in Philadelphia, suddenly uh, for the 100th centennial of the American Revolution, Americans realized, well, we have a past. And they start to get interested in the pre-colonial or the colonial uh, construction. And um, in the 1920s, during the depression, the American government provided jobs to architects by doing measure drawings. Uh, and if you go on the Library of Congress in, in Washington, you can have it online, you have thousands of measure drawings of building across the United States. Uh, and also not only building, but engineering structure like bridges and dams. So the American, have a fairly uh, wide understanding of their uh, heritage uh, uh, building or background. Um, and also they have national parks. Canada took the national park, but never took the, the, the building uh, surveys. So we have actually, we have very little information about the historical production mm -hmm. in Canada. Um, so the, the, there's, a very, there's a great ambivalence regarding old buildings, uh, because if they are old in the logic of, colonial, of extraction, you demolish them. You know, you don't, if they cannot serve the extraction, you remove them. Um, so in fact, the, the preservation is a very difficult thing. Uh, legally, uh, documentation is very, uh, is very minimal. Um, and so what is 
what is the current policy is, is to insist on all the other aspects than the physical. So it's all the social, you know, the cultural study, someone important lived there. Uh, but with, the, with uh, one basic contradiction is that here in, in, in Italy or in the southern part of Europe, you know, a church can be closed and you go back for the years later and there's a little bit of dust, you know, but still pieces are still there. But with the Canadian weather, where you have 60 degree differences between the winter and the summer, things collapse after five years, you know, yeah. if they're not heated. So what you realize is that a lot of buildings disappear and the, the state and the, and the general public is not very much in favor of keeping them. So there's a, 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 as monuments, we try to man, man, mentalize these buildings, but at the same time, if they have no function, they, they disappear. So there's a, very, there's a great ambiguity. Uh, and also today, because of the multicultural uh, policy um, and the multicultural policy has shifted from the historical immigration to the recent immigration. Um, and the recent immigration is uh, in the Western part of Canada is most, mostly from Asia and South America and Africa and other places. Or let's say it's a colored immigration in general, you know. Um, well, you know, something built by Danish uh, settlers in the 19th century has very little interest because it doesn't participate to the current discourse. So there's a great ambiguity related to, to heritage, you know, uh, yeah. because, to, to, uh, because how much it, it would, supply the current discourse or how much it contradicts the current discourse. Um, and so I, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult case. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to modern architecture, um, it's also even more difficult because the, we have a, we imported a lot of uh, construction techniques either from the United States and Europe in the 1950s and 60s that proved to be quite ill adapted to the Canadian weather. So you, you have to restore something that was badly built and it then uh, turns to be extremely difficult. And then if, if, if nobody has that, I have one more mm -hmm. curiosity, no, it's not a question, but a curiosity, the parliament in the book. Yes. What is that? It's, it's a parliament that was in Ottawa. No, 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 that's a local part. It's there. a provincial par parliament. The, ah, provincial. In, the Northern Territories, the, they got a parliament about, about 20 years ago and they built this new apartment outside of the city. But they is would. there a city around? Or well, there's a city that is about probably- there must be an end. No, no, well, there's a, there's a yellow life that is a city probably of about 20 or 25,000 oh. people, but but it's unreachable without a car. Okay. You know, so it means that the parliament is, uh, you know, is, is, is like one of the, it's like the Castello di Rivoli, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? You know, you, you don't you don't go there to discuss with politicians. You know, if you have no purpose, you know, like, the, the images you, you show them are fantastic. Yeah, yes, and it's and it's an ideal democracy for the world. Yeah, exactly, it, it, it's a it's a idyllic image, but it's an extraordinary contradiction in terms of the democratic process. You know, how do you isolate completely uh, members of parliament from the citizens? Um, and in, in that sense, you know, like uh, uh, there's a lot of these contradictions uh, in the relationship to nature and, uh, and this kind of uh, how nature is used actually to isolate uh, people. Yeah. And that's an, an interesting that's part. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about this. I wonder to what extent nature or any idea of nature plays a role in these discussions about architecture and shining. Is there an evolution in ways of representing the way in which Canadian architecture uh, was influenced or reshaped nature? Um, historically, you know, the, the 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 idea of nature was to reproduce as was in Europe. Okay, so uh, if you look at the maps done by the French in the 17th and 18th century. You have gardens that try to replicate what you had in Europe. Either, of course, it's a much smaller state because it was a poor colony. And then with the British system, you had a copy of uh, British gardens and, uh, and up to the point like the, the Bain Park in the cities, like uh, the Mont Royal in Montreal, you know, uh, were a reinterpretation of, of nature. Um, what is interesting uh, from the 1960s, there was this idea of uh, of the wild forest, the Canadian or the Laurentian forest. Um, 
which develop a, a mix of like little trees and bushes and uh, little hills. Um, it, it's very much a, a golf course landscape. Um, so it's a very, um, it's, it looks natural, but it's completely fake. And it's very much used to as, really as a segregation means uh, by separating because you, you don't cross uh, these bushes, you know, you cannot, they become barriers. They're very nice barriers, but they become barriers. So it's, it's very interesting when you have all the discussion about inclusion, the social inclusion never translates into spatial inclusion. We, and that's really one of the great uh, contradictions in Canadian society that we, we practice spatial segregation and we, we talk about social inclusion. But it's all done in a very nice way. <laughs> <laughs> Because we are nice people. Yes, <laughs> of course. I see. <laughs> like our president uh, learned from your friends. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think you, you all all heard like the, the little lessons. Uh, you can be rude, but we no, no, have yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you, you you all heard about the little lessons you sent to do gave to Mrs. Meloni, and um, and it's very interesting in the sense that uh, it's all very trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and it, you wonder how much actually the, the trivial part is a way to avoid real issues. <laughs> <laughs> and we, 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 we like to be trivial also. This is it's nice. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.